Good morning. Well, I need my socks better today. <laughs> Well, we're very glad to be here today and to begin in this discussion with two leaders. Um, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, my name is Tracy Montross. I serve as Regional Director of uh, Government Affairs for American Airlines. American Airlines and our 14,000 employees in the Carolinas serve all 15 commercial service airports in these states. So we're very thankful for the strong leadership that we have in our governor mansions and, um, and to be able to serve as an economic development partner in transportation and mobility. Um, today, we're joined by two executives of two of the fastest growing states in the nation, a Republican and a Democrat, leading Sun Belt communities marked by rapid economic growth and income inequality, increasing congestion, a melting pot of natives and transplants, and both urban and rural sensibilities. Henry McMaster of Columbia became the 117th governor of South Carolina in January of 2017 and is serving his first full term. He began his career serving first as U.S. Attorney appointed by President Reagan and South Carolina's Attorney General from 2003 to 2011, and Lieutenant Governor from 2015 to 2017. Governor McMaster was Chairman of the South Carolina Republican Party and has served on the boards of the South Carolina Courts Authority and the South Carolina Commission on Higher Education. He received a degree in history and his JD at the University of South Carolina, and is married to Peggy, and they have two children. Roy Cooper is also in his first term as governor, having spent nearly three decades of public service, born and raised in Nash County. He worked summers on the family farm before attending UNC Chapel Hill on a Moorhead scholarship. His mother worked as a school teacher and his father farmed and practiced law. After earning his law degree from UNC, um, Governor Cooper returned home to Nash County and went on to represent his home district in the North Carolina House and Senate for more than 14 years. In 2000, North Carolinians elected Cooper as Attorney General, where he served for 16 years before being elected Governor in 2016. Cooper and his wife, Kristen, have three daughters. So while we're here to talk about two states and one region, I must recognize that regional collaboration is best executed when we are in the eye of a hurricane. So thank you um, to, for both of your leadership. Uh, you've certainly had your fair share of disaster response in the last few years. Um, so on behalf of two grateful states, uh, thanks for your perseverance and I'll see your constituents through response, recovery, and rebuilding. To kick things off, I'm going to allow each of our governors to begin with an opening statement. Um, we'll have a few minutes for you to deliver remarks, and I'm going to ask for each of you to start your remarks by identifying three words that you use to describe your state. And we're going to start with you, Governor Cooper. North Carolina, a state of minds, that's what we are, a state of minds. I think that when you talk about North Carolina, we were the first state in this country to open our doors by, to higher education supported by the public. And we have, I think, the greatest university system, community college system in the country. I think our system of higher education is extraordinary and one of our greatest economic tools. So do you want me to go ahead and do my opening statement? <laughs> I didn't realize I was going to get to do an opening statement. Are you going to give me the minute? Okay, I'll take it. Uh, first, I want to thank you for allowing me to be here. Having grown up in rural North Carolina, uh, I've developed a rural economic strategy for our state, and I could talk about that for a long time. But one thing I know is when our urban areas like the Charlotte region succeed, all of North Carolina succeeds. This is an amazing economic engine for our entire state. And we have to focus our efforts on making sure that the Charlotte region is successful. Um, I think you've heard a lot about controversy uh, between me and Republican leadership in the General Assembly, but let's reflect a little bit. A lot of those things continue to, are, are in the news a lot, but what you don't hear about are the things that we've been able to work together on and to have this state on a record pace for attracting good paying jobs 
and being able to put together a strong infrastructure transportation plan and for the first time ever we have more competitive economic incentives and that's because of the cooperation that we have had but let me say this, we have had some significant differences, and I want to take just a minute to try to encourage the business community to engage in these differences. It's important for us to realize that most of the people of North Carolina want balance, and they want their leaders to try and negotiate and achieve consensus on certain issues. I think most people would look and say, one party uh, does not corner of the market on good ideas and that that party shouldn't try to ramrod all of its ideas without negotiation and consensus with others who might have a different opinion. And there are two issues where I think the business community should engage in this process that's going on right now in North Carolina with my veto of the budget and the potential override of that veto. First, every CEO I talk to that is thinking about North Carolina or expanding here, the first thing they care about is quality workforce. Do you have the people? We must make significant, smart investments in education from cradle to career. We have one of the best early childhood systems in the country. We've got four and five star centers. We need to invest in that, in pre-K. I had a conversation with a number of Republican legislators. We had some real differences about public education and what we ought to do, such as private school vouchers and how many charter schools we should have and whether we should slap letter grades on schools and how do we make uh, schools, teachers, and students more accountable. But there was one thing we agreed on, that you're going to get better education when you have a good teacher in every classroom and a good principal in every school, period. So recruiting and retaining that workforce should be a key. And the business community needs to engage in this. We need more uh, teaching fellow scholars who we pull into the teaching profession by saying, hey, we're going to pay four years of your college if you'll give us at least four years teaching in our public schools. That needs to be big, robust, contributed with private money and public money. We need to lift the level of respect for educators, and that means making sure we don't drop behind in teacher salaries. Right now, the budget that I veto raises our teachers less than other state employees. That's the wrong signal to send. And we need to continue our strong support of our community colleges and our universities because they have to be flexible, they have to be nimble, they have to be ready to deal with these companies as they're expanding or moving into our state to provide the kind of training that they need. The other issue is health care. We have a lot of uninsured, and it's contributing to health care costs that are rising for your company. We can have a debate in this room all day about how much government should be involved in health care, but there is one decision that has been made at the federal level, and it's pretty much in concrete. And Congress and the U.S. Senate and the President would have to do something affirmatively to change it. And if they hadn't done it in the last two years, they're not going to do it. The federal government has given the states to opt in to the provision to draw down for North Carolina would be about $4 billion a year to ensure working people who right now make too much to qualify for Medicaid that don't make enough to qualify for the federal subsidies under the Affordable Care Act. And consequently, we have hundreds of thousands of people who are out there working, doing the best they can. I've been at many roundtables across this state, tears running down people's eyes, trying to make it, don't have health insurance. We have an opportunity to do this with one word, yes. We'll take that $4 billion a year 
and that's 90% of the cost, by the way. And we've gotten insurance companies and hospitals to pay the other 10%, so zero additional state tax dollars. What happens? 30 to 40,000 uh, jobs are created, and we've got evidence in 37 other states, so we know it's going to happen if we say yes. And we're going to get five to 600,000 more people covered with health insurance. What does that do? Helps bolster our hospitals, particularly our rural hospitals. 40% of them are operating in the red. It affects the premiums that your businesses pay. We've seen in other states a 7 to 11% reduction in private insurance premiums for everybody else. Because guess what? When you get rid of uncompensated care, you drive down health care costs. We get help in fighting opioid addiction, which we know is affecting the employment place in people's homes and people's lives. I had a conversation with Governor John Kasich of Ohio, Republican governor, who expanded Medicaid in his state. And after I won the debate over who was first in flight, we, we well, I mean, they had a bicycle shop. We flew the plane, case closed. But, <laughs> But he said, thank God we expanded Medicaid because we reduced opioid overdose deaths by 54% in the city of Dayton because they were able to attract more mental health providers and substance use disorders. We have thousands of veterans who don't have access to the VA, don't live close enough or don't qualify for benefits that would be covered by Medicaid expansion. And you know, we have this situation, say, if we hire lobbyists and we scratch, claw, and scrape for federal transportation money, education money, disaster relief money, why not say yes to this? The business community can help us to get this done. There are no good arguments to stop this right now. And we need to say yes. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to look forward to the discussion. Henry McMaster and I have been friends for a long time. We don't necessarily agree with each other on everything, but I know him to be a, a trustworthy person, and he and I, unfortunately, has had to spend a lot of time on the phone when we've been governor dealing with these hurricanes, and we have cooperated significantly together. Uh, he and I both served as attorneys general of our, our each of our states, and uh, I'm glad to be here with you, Henry, in this discussion, and maybe we can learn a little bit more about how we can cooperate on some economic development. So thank you very much. No, come on, all right, that's why I'm here. I'm happy to be here with y'all, and Roy's right. We do a lot of things the same way. We were attorneys general at the same time, now we're governors at the same time. He got on his black suit, I got on mine, I almost wore a blue tie today. We'd be looking just alike. But uh, I want to tell you about South Carolina, and, and by the way, I, I'm not nearly as familiar with North Carolina as I'd like to be, or Georgia, or other parts of the sunny south. But I promise you there are a lot of people around the country that are coming to the sunny south because it is the sunny south. And uh, not too long ago, I was watching the weather, and uh, it was something like 63 degrees in Columbia. It was minus 23 degrees in Michigan or someplace in Minneapolis. And I thought, why in the world? Unless you're born and raised, then why would you be there? And I guess maybe that's the reason. A lot of people are, are coming to North Carolina, coming to South Carolina. But uh, I was uh, born and raised in Columbia, and, and uh, when I was a little boy, we used to vacation at Lake Summit in your beautiful state, right close to Hendersonville. And when the boat would break, we'd take it to Hendersonville. And I went to school for a couple of years in high school, an old prep school in Lenore on the Yadkin Road, the Yadkin Valley, called Happy Valley. Anybody knows that place? Patterson School is, is not operating now. But uh, and I've been to this place a lot. Asheville's beautiful. The, the road park is fantastic. People from all over the world uh, come here. And, and just to top it off, my chief of staff is here. He's a Charlotte native, born and raised. He came to USC in Columbia. And uh, we, we kept him, we stole him and kept him, and we've been working together since uh, 1990. And uh, Trey Walker, you stand up, Trey, let him take a look at you. Trey Walker is telling me.
name is Matt Shaw, and I probably knew his collections a lot of uh, non-North Carolina. His name is Matt Shaw, and his, his others. But our, our secret, and it is no secret, is South Carolina is booming. And it's been, we've had good leadership for a lot of years, and it, it goes way back. Fritz Hollings, who was a U.S. Senator, he was governor way back in the 60s, and he's the one that came up with the idea. They called them vocational schools then, now of course they're technical colleges. We got 16 of them, Wilbur Ross, U.S. Secretary of Commerce, says our technical colleges are the best in the United States. I know North Carolina's got a good system. Everybody's got a, a good system, but we've made the decision over the years that we're going to stick to the nitty on our technical colleges, and they're going to do what they were designed to do. And right now, BMW, Volvo, Mercedes, all those companies, Boeing, all of them, draw heavily on our technical colleges. Because we understand, we understand that the business of South Carolina is business. Without business, without jobs, without economic growth, you can't have it. So we're talking about it. And we have, we have some uh, impoverished areas in our state, and we, made the, we understand that if we have one weak link, if we are known for having a weakness in our economic system or in our, in our, in our society, if we have a weak link, that's not all bad. That's not good. But if we have a weak link and we haven't recognized it and we're not fixing it, that's bad. That's why we made the decision to invest in education. We're going into the, the poor areas. We have uh, uh, passed a, a law that provides $60 million so far for doing something I don't know that many states are doing. And that is to provide, we have closing funds in our, our Commerce Department, but we have a $60 million closing fund for the business if they want to go to a poor school district, and they would go, but for the fact that there's no infrastructure, that the roads, or the sewer, or the water, all the school is raggedy and underperforming, that this money will go to that school district to take care of those things if that company will come. We also have something called Ready SC, and that is we will send people around the world from our technical colleges. Thank you. And other from our technical colleges or from our research universities, if, if they are involved in the process, and often they are. But we'll send them around the world for free to look at the business, look at their manufacturing plant, so to speak, or as an example, as what we've done many times, for free and come back and develop a curriculum specifically for that company. Clemson University is doing the same thing. They have an advanced manufacturing center. We have Boeing has a, a place at the University of South Carolina. IBM, Boeing, Siemens, Jaskawa, that is a um, Japanese robot company, and Samsung also have research and development agreements with the University of South Carolina. And it is and that's the only such thing in the United States. It's easy to do. All you have to do is recognize that our people are never going to prosper unless they, they work. And we have these assets, and if the the answer is what you're doing right here. It is collaboration, communication, and cooperation. Every place I've been, everything I've done in government is, and other things, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, Roy, and in the Attorney General's Office, when you communicate, collaborate, and cooperate, break down the silos, have people talking to each other, letting ideas spring up, finding the good ones, testing the, the ones you wonder about, that is the way to have progress. And we know that in our poor areas, our, our strong areas are getting stronger. They don't need much help. We just got to get the taxes out of the way, get the regulations out of the way. But in the poor areas, how do you, how do you fix that? Well, it's not just dumping money, dumping money. What it is, you have to have jobs. You have to have strong families. You have to have jobs. And you have, and you have to have good education. Those are the three things. Each of them builds on the other. If you're missing one of them, you're not, the other two cannot sustain it. So what we're doing is making an effort in education in, 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 in impoverished areas, impoverished school districts in our, in our state to see that we get the businesses in there. I had a conversation, I'll finish up with this, we had a conversation with a, a school uh, uh, superintendent in um, uh, one of our four counties. It's a beautiful place. If you're an artist and you want to draw birds and go hunt and uh, have some uh, farm, you, you, you can't beat it. But if you're looking, if you're looking to, to move up the economic ladder and develop your skills and all the exciting things that are out there today, this is not the place for you. And they have one school district in this county. And all the children are leaving because there's nothing for them to do, no place for them to go. So I said, man, 
What would happen if one manufacturing company, a good, strong company, came in and opened up in your county and where they had one school district and had 500 new jobs? She took off her glasses, set down her yellow number two pencil and said, that would change everything. We know that that is the answer to the future. And I believe that through collaboration, cooperation, collaboration, and communication among the state agencies and the businesses and the people in South Carolina, I know that is what is bringing us up. And I can just imagine what we could do, Lord, if we were to develop a, a sure enough structure and process, and what you're talking about today, where well, we can do that on a regional basis. There's plenty to go around. And the more we work together, the better it will be. And you ask, what are the three words that I would use? Well, I would describe South Carolina the way that these businesses from around the world, when well, I ask them in these positions I've been in, they say, why did you come to South Carolina? And they talk about the technical colleges, they talk about the mountains, they talk about the ocean, all the beautiful things that both our states have. And they said, it is for three reasons. The people, the people, for whatever reason, the people in our state, in this state, in Georgia, are strong, strong, and other places are strong people. And what they say is when the people of South Carolina, these people who come here and have invested hundreds of millions of billions of dollars, is that when the people of South Carolina give you their word, they keep it. That's why we come to South Carolina. I think that the opportunity that we have right now, right now, to enter into all conversations, discussions, collaborations, communications, collaborations between North and South Carolina, I think are enormous. We think alike, we act alike, we look alike, and we get along. So we all do. And that's my story, and I'm speaking to you. <laughs> selling the Charlotte region over that airline hub south of us, right? Um, so, to that regard, I think Dr. Cooper, if you would, share a little bit about your involvement in selling Charlotte and North Carolina to companies across the world, um, and what, uh, what will help to grab the attention of companies to consider our region? It's, it's an easy sell. In fact, when I'm talking about the Charlotte region to uh, CEOs and those who are trying to recruit or get to expand, you can say, number one, we have the best workforce in the country, highly trained, ready to go. Number two, we have one of the best, if not the best, airports in the country. That means an awful lot to people who are trying to get in and get out and come to board meetings. We've had significant success in uh, getting some companies to come and expand here. The, the Honeywell success, Allstate, Abbott Exchange, uh, keeping Lowe's in North Carolina and having them to expand their tech center downtown was significant. And I think that this is going to be uh, we're, we're going to really create that ecosystem of, we already have FinTech, but we're going to expand that. I, I talk about how uh, Charlotte area is the, the second largest financial center in the country. Now when we have Truist, uh, people in SunTrust and bb and coming together and coming into Charlotte and continuing to expand that footprint uh, that's already there with B of A and Wells Fargo and, and other financial institutions, it, it is extraordinary. I talk about the quality of life that is continuing to improve. I talk about our transportation. You know, if we have some, some weaknesses, it is to continue our investments in our infrastructure because we have stepped up and done well with public transportation, but with I-77 and other issues, I hear the continuing concerns about getting from one place to the next in the region. We have to continue to work on that. 
And I talk about our great community colleges and universities, not only in the Charlotte region, but across our state and how they are ready to adapt to what the new business is doing. You talk to high school seniors today, and you can tell them that over half of the jobs that they'll have an opportunity to get haven't even been invented yet. So if we, if we don't have a top level education system in place, then we're not gonna be able to do it. I also talk about the local business and government leadership that is in the Charlotte region. All of you should pack yourselves on the back. You're all civic-minded, uh, you care about issues like affordable housing and upward mobility. We've seen the studies that are disturbing about people not having enough affordable housing to, to live in, and young African-American males, uh, the, the small chance they have to be able to get up to a higher economic strata. Many of you have taken that on with Mayor Lyles and the city council members who are here working with businesses. That's a good thing. That's a public spirit thing. And I talk about the fact that, that the Charlotte region is really a small town in an urban area because of the way we treat each other. We care about each other. Uh, some of the best salespeople are the CEO, business leaders who are already here when we get uh, agreements from these companies that we can let you talk to them you are our greatest salesman. So I think this regional alliance is a great idea to pull in more people so that we can continue to sell ourselves. And like I say, it's an easy sell, but there are a lot of, uh, of good places that people can go, that companies can go now. We have to work hard to remain our, keep our competitive edge. Finally, I know I'm going on a long time. I think earlier in the last few years before I became governor, we had gone off the rails a bit with uh, an overeager legislature that had passed social legislation, bathroom bill, and those kinds of things that sent the wrong message. I think we have recovered from that, uh, pulling together to repeal House Bill 2, uh, trying to stop some of this social legislation that does not bode well for a lot of companies that we're trying to recruit to come into North Carolina, to send a signal out there that North Carolina doesn't discriminate, that we value diversity. I've appointed by far the most diverse and qualified cabinet in the history of our state, that we are welcoming, that we are open for business. Many of the private <coughs> companies have discovered, discovered the value of diversity and how it increases the bottom line. And I believe strongly that state government should look like the people that it serves and protects. And we're sending that message out there across the country and across the world that North Carolina is open for business and we're ready to do it. And of course, the Carolina Panthers and the Charlotte Hornets and the Charlotte Knights, all of those things help us with, with quality of life. <coughs> Are, are key to, to our area, and, and we're going to keep working to, to try to show these companies all of those things as we recruit to our state. Yes, sir. You opened the door in Carolina Panthers. I have to thank you, <laughs> Governor McMaster, for your support um, for uh, the Panthers across the border. It is a regional asset. We recognize that. Talk a little bit about your support. Well, I think that, that's a great, a great example of uh, Dave Tepper, who is uh, you know, who owns, owns the Panthers, uh, refers to the team as the two, state, two states, one, one team. Well, that, that's regional. But I'll tell you, when the Panthers come to, to South Carolina, uh, in, into York County, is a very big deal. Because what he has in mind is a, a tremendous thing. With his atrium and health is in the room somewhere. That's going to be, that's gonna be a, a part of that, a convention center. Uh, retail, uh, all of it, as well as the magnificent training facility. We, we look forward to people coming to for sports medicine from all around the world. But that is a that is a great example, and probably is that's the best one I can come up with so far of a regional cooperation, because it, they can play the games in Charlotte and they can practice in South Carolina and in York County, and just think of, think of the, the money involved uh, in, in that. And Dave Tepper uh, thinks big, and he's thinking bigger and bigger, and the more people we have thinking like that, the 
better will be. That's a, that's a business idea. We're looking for ideas. But one idea that is, has been broached in that is uh, light rail from Charlotte to Rock Hill. Can you imagine how that would take the vehicles off, off of I-77 and also how nice that would be? And if we can do that, if, if, we can, if we can accomplish that and hook into the blue, the blue line and the red line, have it running down into, into South Carolina, into York County, and on beyond, that could be an example of what we can do for all over both of our states. And whether it's, it goes across the state line, which, by the way, is invisible now. You can't even fly. I'm flying in the airplane up here. If you have not flown in a small plane or a helicopter like Roy and I have, looking at hurricanes lately, if you've not done that and, and gone over and looked at this state, you really do need to do it. Because there's no other way to do it. You can ride on the roads, but you've got to get up in the air to really see how beautiful this place is. Which brings up the point we've got to be sure not to mess the place up in our quest for business and economic growth. We have to realize why it is that it was so special. And it's not it's because of agriculture, it's because of tourism, it's because of the natural environment. Um, Christy Todd Whitman was a governor of New Jersey years ago, and I was at a meeting, and she was making a talk and we were in Columbia looking out from one of the tall buildings that are not, not near as tall as the ones here. But nevertheless, we're looking down on the University of South Carolina and the old historic horseshoe and it's just beautiful in the green and the confluence of the Saluda and the broad rivers that turned into the concrete right there. And it was gorgeous. And we were talking about, I was talking about economic growth and she looked, we were looking at this beautiful what nature has given us and she said, hey, that's a good idea, a good plan. I hope you don't miss this up. But apparently they messed it up in New Jersey and once you mess it up it's very hard to fix. So we have to understand that a lot of the, the attraction that our state has is its rural nature and it, the beautiful environment. But if we can if we can collaborate, communicate and cooperate and be confident in what we're doing with with imagination and innovation, I really don't think there's there's anything that, that we can't do. And I can promise you this from I know the people in South Carolina are, are eager for, for economic growth and prosperity. And the more we can do together to make that work, the better it's going to be. And we'll follow. Thank you, sir. Governor Cooper, you touched on this a little bit, but can you expand a little bit more about the connection between urban and rural communities? How is the future of an urban community tied to the success of a rural community? We're 16 counties represented here and the diversity of, of those communities uh, representing the Charlotte region. Speak a little to the connection there. Well, clearly when we can improve our transportation, whether it's public transportation or making sure that we have good roads, you can have people commuting into and out of uh, the two areas. And that can be very positive for job growth. But we also have a strategy of businesses having different kinds of things that they need that are better suited in an urban area, but they may need some kind of advanced manufacturing facility or warehouse facility or something that may fit a rural area better. We've done some joint recruiting trying to get them both into the urban and rural areas. One thing I know we have to do to make our rural areas prosper is to get high-speed internet access across our state. You cannot run a small business, you cannot get the kind of education you need unless you have it. I also think that we can do more cooperation with water sewer infrastructure. Many of our areas, in rural areas in North Carolina, are suffering because their water sewer is, is so old and they don't, if they are, doing these things alone, then they have a very difficult time of being able to afford replacing these systems. I think we have to regionalize water and sewer infrastructure. I've proposed a significant bond that I believe should go before the people that includes funding for our public schools, funding for, I mean, capital construction, funding for capital construction at our community colleges and universities, and then regional water systems that you couldn't get the money until you come up with a good regional plan about how you're going to provide water and sewer in your area. 
I think now is the time for that. That is another dispute we are having right now regarding our budget. Uh, we just sold build NC bonds for 1.99% interest rate. My goodness, I mean, when are we ever going to get interest like, and Mr. President gets it down to zero or whatever he said, but if, when are we ever going to get interest rates like this at a time when we need this kind of investment? And when you have a bond, it's something that the people vote on, and it's something that you know, everybody knows what they're going to get. So we know that infrastructure and education are critical, and our rural and urban areas can cooperate. I mean, what you've done here is taking the critical step to say these more rural counties that surround the Charlotte area are part of us. We, we are going to, to have a mutually interdependent uh, interaction, which I think is critically important. I think that's positive. Master, this group is one of our pillars, is focused on public policy and advocacy. And we hope to represent effectively the four counties in the upstate on your side of the border uh, in Columbia with the General Assembly. In your opinion, is there uh, any suggestion that you would have for how we can be effective in helping to represent business in those four counties and just continue to uh, spark growth in the upstate? Um, and any other advice you might have for us as we try to uh, involve ourselves in public policy? Yes, go see. <laughs> Uh, pick up the phone. I, I know that we're encouraging in all of our agency heads and, and others to to uh, communicate, collaborate, and cooperate. And, and part of that is there's, there's a lot of folks too. They just pick up the phone and call. We don't stand on too much ceremony. If you got a good idea, if you need something, but don't presume that, that I think Roy would say the same thing. Don't presume that those of us in these offices have a clue about what, what that good idea is or what you what you need. So we encourage people to tell us and write it down and don't be shy. You can, uh, the, the Jack Kemp used to say, uh, the, the politics is not a spectator sport. You got to get out to stand and get down on the field. And if you if you establish yourself, either in yourself or your representative is someone who knows who they're talking about, that presents the facts, not opinion. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. As to why this business would work better, what, what you need to, to, to do, just let us know. And uh, we can, in, in South Carolina, with the, our legislature, we can move, move pretty quickly when we need to. That we got the, the whole thing this thing. Gosh, we have that legislation through what trade is that? <coughs> Two months. Two months. That's a, I think that's a world record. We're looking to break it. So if you, if you need help, uh, let us know. Uh, we are. We believe in business, and we know that, that business is big or small, or the people are, are looking for jobs. And we know this is an obstacle that we have, we have, we have, I think that most of the country has, is the, the job market has changed. The, the jobs out there have changed. It used to be that uh, everybody wanted a four-year degree. Well, that's great. And that was admirable after World War II and all that with the GI Bill. That was a great thing. But you well know that everyone does not need a four-year college degree now in order to use their brains and all their hands and have a great life and do something they want to do. That's why our technical colleges and the collaborations that we're doing with businesses, with internships and apprenticeships, we give them tax incentives to do that, and they're all doing it. And it's, it's working like a charm, but the biggest obstacle is a cultural one to convince the parents and the administrators and the students that these two-year degrees, or sometimes even this and that, are, are about for, for a lot of the population, probably most of the population, a, a four-year degree, and you get out, and you out in two years, you get a good-paying job, you have no student debt, buy your house, go to the beach, go to the moons. It's just a great thing, and we, we can do that. And BMW is one of the leaders in our state, as you know, being with uh, Boeing's there, Mercedes is there, Volvo's there, Volvo, they started expanding, they uh, entered into the building, the, the plant down in uh, New Charleston, and before they finished that, they already made the expansion plans, and we just opened up a new interstate exchange, uh, inter interchange form, doing the same, same thing for the Panthers. It's, we can get those things done uh, quickly, because we, we believe in communicating, collaborating, working together.
But uh, in, in Spartanburg, and Greer, actually, BMW, that's their biggest manufacturing plant in the world. In the world. They produce a new BMW every 61.7 seconds. That's about 450,000 a year, and they are there at 61.7 seconds in a month. The only thing that builds more stuff faster than that than is the uh, uh, York County buildings and schools in uh, Fort Mill. I think that's the only thing. But you see, we grow, and we understand that, that, that there should not be these barriers between people and between business and between the government. And when you break down those walls, you can make progress. It's just as simple as everything else you do in your own life. Uh, you, you talk to each other and you work together. That's what we try to do. I forgot what your question was. <laughs> you summed up the theme of this discussion. Collaboration and communication, and we so and we so appreciate you both being here and making the trip to Charlotte, particularly with everything that's going on in Raleigh. Um, thank you very much for being here today uh, and to join this group of 120 civic and business leaders to share your insight remarks. We do have a gift uh, of Joe Boss over here, who is our senior vice president for public policy with the Alliance. Um, we'll present a gift to both of you um, and to the state of North Carolina. Um, uh, Joe, if you would, just come on up. Thank you very much again for being here.